Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, it's a packed house. Um, You've got a great audience. Yeah, so um, my name is Matt Doherty. Um, you know me, Julia, so, and Daniel knows me too. Um, uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, Pesticide Use Enforcement 101 today. And um, we are, I originally made this talk to be kind of an introduction for growers that have never had to deal with pesticides before mm -hmm. or any kind of pesticide regulation. So I designed the talk to be very um, introductory and basic and not get too convoluted with stuff. Um, so, and I think I did a, I think I did a pretty good job of that. So, um, in your packet, there's a couple things. Um, there's a copy of the, the presentation. Um, there's a sheet on uh, what is a pesticide. Um, I'm going to go into that a little bit in more detail. Um, so, there's that. There's a, a sheet on. Uh, pesticide use on cannabis. Um, this is put out by DPR, and it's basically you wanted to fit, try to fit pesticide use on one page. This is they did that here. So, and um, also a sheet on California restricted materials. This is just kind of an info sheet. Um, growers can't aren't able to use restricted materials, but I figured it'd be good for people to have anyway. Yes, yeah, so they know that they can't use it. Yeah. So, uh, this gets started here. Um, so, the goals for today are, the first one is to first gain an understanding of what we do as the Ag Commissioner's Office and how we fit in um, as a regulatory agency, um, specifically with pesticide use. And then also to begin to understand some of the, uh, well, of the many requirements that growers are going to be expected to follow if they're using pesticides on their cannabis. And you'll find that there's a lot of laws and regs and they're, they can be pretty complex. So, uh, The outline, um, I'm going to first talk about our office and how we work as a regulatory agency. Um, then I'm going to go into the federal pesticide laws and then also the state pesticide laws. And then the bulk of the talk is going to be um, the requirements of growers when they use pesticides. So more specifically, licensing and certification, uh, permitting, uh, training, and then basic uh, pesticide operations. So just uh, real quick, um, the County Ag Commissioner system, it's a pretty unique system um, in the nation. Uh, most states have one ag department for the whole state. So like Oklahoma will have the Oklahoma ag department. Um, California is different in that we do have the CDFA, but each county has its own ag commissioner's office. Um, and this is for a couple reasons. Um, one is that California is a pretty large state, um, so it would be tough for one location to regulate the whole state, but also that California is very diverse and uh, over 400 different crops grow and each county is different. So it kind of needs that, it kind of needs each county needs its own ag department to regulate the laws in their own county. Because uh, like San Diego is going to be a lot different than Mendocino County. So. Yeah, no one knows Mendocino County better than Mendocino County does it. Exactly, yep. Um, so that's just kind of interesting. Not, I don't think any other states do that. Like we're the only one that does that. I think New York might do it, but I think we're the only one. So what do we do? Um, in a nutshell, we enforce all the laws and regs outlined in the Food and Ag Code and uh, the Code of Regulations and the Business and Professions Code. So. I have a question about that. Yeah. Is cannabis the only business and profession code, or is there another <clears throat> agricultural crop that it falls under? No. So the bus the other thing we regulate in the business and professions code is the weights and measures. Right. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So, so like it's a good segue. So, 
Not only do we do the ag stuff, but we do all the weights and measures, check all scales, gas stations, propane, um, cattle scales. Um, for the agricultural side of things, we do nursery inspections, uh, we inspect farmers markets, uh, we regulate the farmers markets, make sure they're following all their laws and regs, regulate sudden oak, sudden oak death, uh, we have a whole program for that. But today, we're here to talk about one of our bigger programs, and that's called the Pesticide Use Enforcement. So it's PUE, so when you hear me say PUE, it's what I'm talking about, it's Pesticide Use Enforcement. And we spend a lot of time on this uh, program uh, so that we do things like headquarters inspections. Uh, we go and check people's records. What do you mean um, by headquarters? So we go out to people's farms Sorry. and check and see if they have training rec their mm -hmm. proper training records, use reports, make sure they're storing things properly, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, it's a big, a big laundry list of regs that we check. Uh, we do surveillance of pesticide applications, so we basically drive around and go and see people to see if people are spraying, and we'll stop and make sure they're following all the laws and regs. Uh, we issue permits for use reporting, um, and also restricted materials permits, because um, you have to do monthly use reporting if you're spraying um, uh, ag commodity with pesticides. We give continuing education to our growers, what this is right here, what we're doing right now. And we also are in charge of investigations of pesticide illnesses. So if someone thinks that they got, um, if they drove through a drift of so a spray and they think they might have got ill, or they got hurt on the job, or they think they got poisoned, they could contact us and we can, and we will do an investigation at that point to see if there was any wrongdoing or if it was an accident or if the fine need, needs to be levied. So, Daniel, Julia, yes. since we're talking about pesticides, I want to ask you, when you hear the word pesticide, what do you think? What's, what comes to mind? Anything. <laughs> Definition or... Chemicals. Chemicals? But it's really not just chemicals. Okay. I think that's the typical yeah. response from most people. Mm -hmm. Um, like, I give out these to all of my um, retain retainer clients uh, who use neem oil or any kind of foliar spray mm -hmm. for prevention or nutrients. Okay. Just so they know that they need to, and I don't to come in here and register. Okay. <laughs> yeah, generally, you're right. It's kind of a bad, sort of bad chemical okay. type of thing people think of. But, um, so, uh, legally, so the definition of a pesticide is, um, so A is any spray adjuvant, so a spray adjuvant is something that you put in with the pesticide and makes it stick better to the plant, makes it spread better. Um, also any substance mixture of substances which is intended to be used for defoliating plants, regulating plant growth. Can you think of anything that's used to regulate plant growth that's used commonly in the industry? Nurseries use it a lot. I think a lot of people use it a lot. I don't work with a lot of those people. Rooting hormones? Yeah. Rooting hormones. Oh, really? Rooting hormones? Is yeah, so hormones? rooting hormones are considered pesticides. Oh my god. Yeah. And if you look on the labels of rooting hormones, they should have an EPA reg number. Okay. So that's not like a bad thing. I mean, no, I it's just, just nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, that's why we're given trying to give these classes. Um, so, and also for preventing. So I have a lot of clients that use rooting hormones. Yeah, well, I think most people most people do. Yeah. I use it. Um, or it's any. Uh, so any substance for preventing, destroying, repelling, mitigating any pests which may infest or be detrimental to vegetation, man, animals, etc. Yeah. Right. So anything that kills any pest that's de that's, a pet, that's detrimental to us. Right. Not just kill them. Yeah. Not just kill, destroying, repelling. Yeah. yeah. So it's a very you can see it's a very broad yeah. definition, and it can include a lot of things. Um, also. You could look at pesticides and what they kill. So there's 
So when you hear the word pesticide, it's kind of a broad term. It, so also with pesticides, they encompass herbicides, which kill plants. Insecticides kill insects. Rodenticides, miticides, there's all hundreds of different kinds. So you hear, I hear a lot of times people will go, well, I don't use any pesticides, but I have Roundup. Well, they're kind of, that's sort of, they're not saying that right, because herbicides are a type of pesticide. So pesticide, broad term, it can encompass a lot of different, more specific things. And apart from what they kill, there's other categories that could be assigned. So like we, I mentioned earlier, so there's restricted materials. Um, and these are pesticides that are more toxic to human health and the environment. And they have restrictions associated with them. So you have to get a special permit to spray them. You can only spray them at certain times of the year. You can't spray them at certain times of the year. Um, so things like that. So they're more tightly regulated than other pesticides. And then there's the exempt products. What and, do the asterisks mean? Uh, asterisks mean, that's, I think that's my cue to talk about. Thank it's, you. Yeah. Um, so the exempt products, you see these a lot probably. They're the oils, all the, the clove oil, lemongrass oil. So these products are actually exempt from registration requirements. So they do not have to be registered with the EPA. Now, that being said, these products are still considered pesticides, okay? So if someone had an employee that was using these, they would still have to train that employee. They'd still have to provide the proper PPE required by regulation. They would not have to report the use because it's not a registered pesticide, okay? So, question. Yeah. How do you manage violations of that? I mean, I guess it would only be on spot checks or something. I mean, there are plenty of people that don't have employees that use neem or other oils, and um, they're not wearing the garb. And if it's not, if it's their, you mean if it's like the owner that's doing that, then that's they don't have to. It's only with employees. Yeah, and we'll I'll go into that in more detail of what laws are required in what situations. Um, but yeah, the short of it is if it's the owner operator that's doing the spraying, they basically have to only follow the label. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, so the and then organic pesticides, right? These are the OMRI approved. So these are ones that you can use for organic production. Um, so I guess my point is with this is the word pesticide carries with it a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of usage with it, and it can mean a lot of different things. Um, so. That handout I gave you, it'll go into a little more detail about what is a pesticide, and that's put out by DPR. Any other questions? Matt? Oh. So I'm just going to jump into the some of the laws that were mandated to um, enforce. And the first one, I'm going to start with the federal laws. And all federal pesticide laws are um, regulated by the EPA and the first main act is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA for short, call it FIFRA. Um, and this provides the broad legislative framework to regulate at the federal level. So I just go around going FIFRA, FIFRA, <laughs> like right around, you know, that's what I'm thinking about. It's great. You know, I actually don't go in, we don't, I don't look at FIFRA that much. <coughs> but FIFRA. Yeah, so they so this talks about things like registration, how to register pesticides, um, the sale and use of pesticides, fees, penalties for certain violations. But more importantly is this law gives states the authority to regulate the use of pesticides. So California gets its authority to make its own pesticide laws from this, this act here. And then the second main one is the Worker Protection Standard, the WPS. And this is the federal code that outlines the requirements of employers 
um, of what they have to do for their employees in regards to safety. So it talks about things like the training, what topics do you have to cover when you're training your handlers and field workers, uh, medical requirements, uh, personal protective equipment, the, uh, regulations on what they have to wear when they're spraying, and decontamination. So all these are outlined in the worker protection standard. So then now for the state pesticide laws, these are all administered by the Department of Pesticide Regulation, DPR, um, pretty well known agency. And this, like the federal code, the food and ag code, this provides the legislative framework to regulate at the state level, okay? So it defines things like food, insect, pesticide, kind of big, broad words. So this is where those words get defined. It's in the, this code. Uh, it talks about licensing and permitting, different types of violations, how much you get fined for certain violations, how to register pesticides at the state level, and then once again, fees for different license types and permits. And then there's the code of regulations. And when we're out doing inspections, a, a lot of the codes that we're looking at are within the, this, this um, set of laws here. It's the California Code of Regulations. And so this starts to get a little more specific for things. So like for definitions, right? Closed system, fuel capacity, it's, it's kind of more um, some more specific terms starts to get start to get defined in this. Um, talks about environmental protection, um, specific requirements for certain pesticides, and like I just talked about the worker protection standard. All the worker health and safety is in this code section here, and we call it the 6700 series because it starts with 6700 and it goes down. So when we're out on inspections, like I said, we this is the the nitty gritty here. We're looking at a lot of worker health and safety stuff on those inspections. So just briefly, this outlines the relationship between California law and federal law. So as you probably know that when the feds make, so specifically when the feds will make a, they'll make a change to a pesticide law, California either, California has to adopt that. And if it hasn't already adopted that, um, they need to change their code to match that. So it can never be less strict than the federal code. Nice. And, yeah. It can never be less strict. So, but it can always be, it has to be as strict or more strict. And you probably, you'll find that with pesticide, it's, it's right, it's in this box here with California. California has some of the most strict pesticide laws in the nation. Okay, so requirements. This is going to be the bulk of the talk. Yeah. So before we get into the bulk of the talk, I have a question that's kind of off subject or on subject. How does the Right to Farm Act influence or not influence all of this? Well, I'm not sure. Just like specifically the pesticide stuff. Well, it it actually because with doesn't. drifting and that kind of thing, we're like if you're agriculture on on the edge of residential, yeah. Or you go, you could even bring in the GMO non-GMO uh, situation in that, I guess. But the reason I ask is here, well, in many counties, but not all of them. Uh, they're claiming that the Right to Farm Act doesn't apply to cannabis. And so I'm curious to understand how the Right to Farm Act applies to pesticides. Well, as, if you don't so, know, I can it, ask. so as far as I know, DPR is considering cannabis the agricultural commodity. That's right. Now, right, so you're saying why would D, why is DPR considering it an ag commodity, but it's not being considered an ag commodity with, between other department agencies? I'm not sure, but I mean, as far as Four. we're concerned, Four. yeah, as far as we're concerned, 
the whole, I mean, the cannabis growers are going to follow all the they pesticide have. laws. They have to, yeah. And I think the right to farm law. I have a lot of attorneys uh, asking me right now. I think there's going to be a lawsuit, a uh, statewide lawsuit on this, because um, I know here that was my first thing, the right to farm a nuisance. Um, when they when the state made it an agricultural commodity, and they are a lot of like all oh, as an applied canvas. But the, oh, the CDFA it. considers it an agricultural product instead of a commodity, right? And that's why yeah. there's no right to farm. And it's in the well, and also for the, and it's in the B and P code. It's not in the food and agriculture. Well, code. that's the answer I think that there are a lot of attorneys that disagree with that statement. I, it's not my fight, so I don't yeah. know. But um, I'm just curious how right to farm, if a pesticide flows onto a neighboring property, whether it's a farm or a residence or whatever, does the right to farm exempt any kind of... Um, For other crops? Yeah, or, or people's no. health. See, like, no. this, this, this influences the right to farm, right? It's like you have the right to farm, but you have to farm within the parameters set by DPR. Right. Right. It's not. So what, what, if you're, what if you're farming within the parameters set by DPR and this still happens? This wind? Well, then that's, that's if there's we, drift or something, that's when we enforce the yeah. pesticide laws. Yeah. Right. So how does that work then, you guys? How does that enforce? I mean, what's the penalty? We go and we... If someone calls and says, like, I drifted on, we go out and we do an investigation. And if we find evidence that that farmer drifted on someone, they'll get a fine. They will. Yeah. Okay. They don't say it's the wind and have no control over it. No, they do have control over it. Yeah, they have to pay attention to the wind yeah, that's the law. before they apply. Good. Protection Good. of persons, animals, property is Good. a law that Good. generally they have to, you know, they need to be looking at the environment. Good. Mm -hmm. So in the law, if it's windy, you can't spray, basically. Yes, or, yeah. you can't drift. Yeah, you can't drift off your property. Good. Mm -hmm. good, good, good. So for the requirements, there's going to be four um, topics. So first one's going to be licensing and certification. Um, we'll go over four different types. Who needs what, when? Then we're going to go over permitting. Um, what's known as the operator ID. And then training, the two different types of training, the handlers and the field workers. And then the pesticide operations. Uh, so like PPE, decon, labeling, things like that. Um, so before we get into that, I kind of want to make the point is that, that um, pesticide use isn't, the laws aren't always a one size fits all type of deal. Um, your situation is going to determine what laws are going to kick in and that you have to follow. So, for instance, you need to ask, so you could ask yourself, do you have employees that handle pesticides? If you don't, then there's a whole set of laws that don't apply to you. Okay, but if you do, that's when that 6700 series worker health and safety laws kick in. Okay, so that's going to determine what you have to follow. Um, are you a pest control business or just a property operator? If you're a pest control business getting work for hire, which more pest for hire, you need to get a pest control business license. Uh, you know, what types of pesticides do you use? Are you using restricted materials, organophosphates, <coughs> carbamates? Does the, res does the pesticide require a respirator? All different regulations kick in when you're using certain things. Um, who's training who? Are you a qualified trainer? Did you get your employees trained by a qualified trainer? What is a qualified trainer? So um, it's these questions you need to kind of ask yourself and then when you figure that out, you can, you, you'll have a better idea of what laws will kick in, what you need to follow. So licensing, certification. There's four main types. I don't. I didn't go over the PCA license just because it's not super. Um, these oh, ones are the main ones uh, that are more important. So the first one's the private applicator certificate, or the PAC card. 
or we also call it the TAM card. Um, and these are for growers that are running their own operations and they either want, so if you get this card you can buy restricted materials and this card gives you the ability to train your employees. You're considered a qualified trainer when you have this card uh, for field workers and handlers. Um, but only of your own or can you train others? You or? can train others. So it's only for, so it's only for production agriculture. Okay. So this tan card, you can't take this tan card and go work for, say, a maintenance gardener. It only counts for production ag. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but you could train, if you had this card, you could train someone else's employees on a different farm. Or if you wanted to send your employee to get this card, take the test, they would be considered trained at that point. Okay. This is the most common one we're seeing. I mean, this is the one that would, it's mo most applicable to cannabis growers. Um, then the second one is the Qualified Applicator Certificate, or the QAC. And this is for anyone who is using pesticides or supervising the use of pesticides other than production ag. So, like I said, for instance, maintenance gardeners. Mm -hmm. They would have to get they have to get a QAC card, and also um, wineries when they do SO2, mm -hmm. um, they need they have to have a QAC as well. But this can also count for production ag as well. So if someone had this, they could go to a farm and be considered a qualified trainer. Oh yeah. Okay. Great. So then the third one is the what's called the QAL or the Qualified Applicator's License. And this is a harder uh, license to get. Um, and this is for if you want to get a pest control business license, in order to get that license, you have to have a Qualified Applicator's License first. Do all the employees have to have that or just No, the just the owner. owner. One person has to have it. Okay. It's generally the owner. Um, yeah, it's for it's basically for people that are overseeing large operations, lots of employees. Um, you have to get a lot of you have, you have to get forty hours of continuing ed, whereas other ones you have to get twenty. So a lot more in depth. I think the test is harder, more expensive. And the last one is the pest control business license or PCB license, and this is for anyone who, if you're getting hired. To do pest control, if you're getting killed to pay. Pe if you're getting pay if you're getting paid to kill pests, then you need to get this license. Okay, so for example, like all the vineyard management companies, they have to get this license and landscape maintenance as well. So do you? I know the Farm Bureau offers continuing education. Does the county offer continuing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have a grower class every year. Um, it's two hours of mm -hmm. two hours of laws and regs. Okay, so then for permitting, so I use so I kind of changed this talk a little bit. I talked about restricted material permits too, but I figured it's don't even I shouldn't even get into that since they can't use it anyway. So the main one is what's called the operator identification number. <clears throat> and anyone that's producing an ag commodity and they're using pesticides on that, they have to get an operator ID and they have to report that you, the use of that pesticide to us. Now, do they have to take a class to do continuing education on that? No, this is just, yeah. the only thing they have to take the test is the PAC card. Yeah, and this is free, and you just have to make an appointment, we'll set you up with one. And it's basically just a mechanism to report your pesticide use. That's all That's all it is. It's not any kind of permit that you have to get for you to even to spray the pesticide. So that one isn't in there, right? That slide isn't in there. No, that should be. That should be in there. Permitting. Yeah, so that's kind of a, 
that's a point of confusion sometimes. People think they actually have to get this to be able to spray. I mean, that's technically kind of right, but you have to get this so because you, you need to report your use. That's why you need to get this. Um, and like I said, remember, you only need to report registered pesticides. So all those exempt products, all the oils, citric mm -hmm. acid, um, you wouldn't have to report that because there's no EPA register. Okay. I think there was some, some confusion with at one point that was being talked about that. But Neem does have EPA register, correct? Right? Yeah, it should. Besides the leaf polish? Yeah. Um, okay, so any other questions on that? I'm just kind of throwing out a lot of stuff here. Um, okay, so then we're going to talk about training now. And there's two main types of training that you can give your employees. And the first one is what's called field worker training. Um, so a field worker means any person for any kind of compensation performs cultural activities in the Activities in a treated field. Now, underline asterisk treated field. So, what that means is if you apply pesticides to your crop, you're done, you apply it. 30 days after that point, that field's considered treated. Now, if you have people working in that field, they have to be trained in, with field worker training. Okay? This also applies to greenhouses and hoop houses as well. So, for example, right, so people are going leafing, pulling leaves, uh, you know, tying, they're in contact with that plant, with the residue on it. Mm -hmm. They need to have this training. And you have, it has to be done by a qualified trainer. Mm -hmm. um, some of the topics covered. Um, some of the same stuff, so decontamination, uh, emergency medical care uh, information, you know, where to go, what's the hospital's phone number if someone gets sick, how to recognize symptoms of pesticide poisoning, uh, the location of the app specific info, you know, what was sprayed, where and when, how much of it was sprayed, um, and also employees' rights, because um, employees are subject to not be, to not you can't retaliate, the employer can't retaliate against their employee for saying that they got sick or thinking that they got sick. <clears throat> this is what the form looks like, the field worker training form. And we have copies, if you know, you have any clients that want to get copies yeah. of these, we have, you know, we have copies of all this. Great. So you can see, you just, um, it has all the topics here you need to cover. You, so you put the name of the trainer, you go through each topic, and people would print their name, sign it, and then they're trained. Now, this is every year. This is annual. It used to be every five years, but the field worker training changed to every year. So the second type of training is the pesticide handler training. Now, a handler means any person who mixes, loads, transfers, applies, or assists in applying pesticides. Okay, so it's the person doing the spray. And there's more topics to cover. There's a lot more topics to cover than the field worker. Can you think of the reason why there'd be more topics? Because they're utilizing the substances themselves. Uh, so you need storage, how you mix, there's could be chemical reactions. Mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of what are they, issues. Yeah, what are, they, that. what are they doing? What are they handling at this point? And they're handling the constant, it's the concentrated product. Right. That's why it's, so it's, it's at this point when they're mixing with that concentrate, that's the most dangerous that's point right. in the whole process is because if any of that concentrate gets in your eyes, I mean, the diluted product can hurt you too, but if that, any of that concentrate gets on your skin, you swallow any of that, that's where the damage can really be done. So it's at this point where safety um, and you know emergency medical care training is really important. Right, especially for like chemical burns. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. 
So some of the topics covered, um, reading the label, and we're actually going to go through a label in a second here. Um, protective clothing, equipment, PPE, routes of pesticide exposure, you know, what ways a pesticide can get into the body. Um, how to triple rinse containers, decontamination once again, and, once, and also symptoms of pesticide poisoning. I'm just curious, mm -hmm. uh, what do you do with the rinse? You put it into the container. I mean, once it's, once you dump it back out again. Is it considered a pesticide if you're rinsing out the container? Yeah, so you triple rinse, right? And you're, so you're putting that rinsate into your spray tank. Right. So you're using it all. So you're saying, what is the... Rinsate considered yes. pesticide. Yes, that's still considered product. Yeah, and you have to you have to take that and put it. You putting it because it's diluted. Mm -hmm. So when you're putting it into your you're putting it into your spray tank that you're going to be spraying. Mm -hmm. That's what you have to do with it. Mm -hmm. And then you spray it. Then you, you're, then you spray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then is that considered? A contaminated field or a treated field? Mm -hmm. 30 days uh -huh. after you spray. Okay. Yes, yeah. that's, that's what I was trying to <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, this is what the handler training form looks like. You can see it's a little more in depth. And basically, it's the same thing. Each employee gets his or her own sheet. You go, you go through each topic, initial it, and one of the differences with the handler union is you have to go over each specific pesticide that they are using. So say they're using three different, your employees are using three different types of pesticides. You have to list those here. Then you have to go over the specifics of that pesticide. So you have to go over the label of new oil. You have to go over the safety procedures for specifically for new oil. Um, and this is every year as well. This is an annual training. And these records, this is what we look for when we do headquarters. These are the kind of things we're looking for. Do you have updated uh, training records? Do you have updated pesticide use records? And if you don't have that, if you don't have updated records, and we find out that you've, employees have been spraying, we can cease that operation until you actually get them trained. And possibly the time. And then, yeah, I mean, if you're you can use your that. Mm -hmm. So now, um, on the home stretch here, the pesticide operations. Um, so first off is the pesticide storage. Um, containers have to be secure. Um, they have to be in a locked um, either building or cabinet. Um, the storage area needs to be posted. Now, it only needs to be posted if you have warning or danger materials. If you just have caution materials, then it doesn't have to be posted, technically. Now, we do encourage people to post any kind of pesticide storage area. Um, but if we came out and you just had caution material and you didn't have it posted, we couldn't legally give you a violation for that. We do encourage it, though. Um, containers have to have the original label with it. Um, and you have to keep pesticides in their original containers, so no Gatorade bottles or water bottles or things like that. It's um, actually a hot. That's actually a big portion of the pesticide illnesses are people putting it in their, yeah. and kids drinking it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So read the label. And this is you're going to hear me say this a lot the rest of the talk. Is the label is the law. The label is the law. Um, we're always going to make it a habit to read the label of every pesticide that you're using before you use it to know what are the safety procedures, what you have to wear, and things like that. But always read the label. And in your packet, we actually have a label that we're going to go through. We're going to look at the, this information and see where you find it. 
And it should be in the back of the packet. Or maybe it's the, in the front. Where after those few pages. Uh, the next one, I think. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so the label, there's a lot of information on the label. And it could seem kind of overwhelming if you don't know how to read it. But generally, they're usually set up in the same, the same way, and this, the information's kind of in the same areas. So um, if you know how to read it, you know what you're looking for, you can find things quickly. So the first thing it's always going to tell you is what the product can be used on. So if you look at this Eagle 20 here, um, you look right under the name, it says systemic protectant, curative fungicide for disease control of established turf grass, landscape ornamentals, greenhouse and nursery ornamentals, apples, stone fruits, and grapes. Okay, so I already know what this product can be used on from that little paragraph right there. Okay, can't use it on lettuce. If you use it on lettuce, then that's a label violation. So then the next thing is... And a label violation is a, a, you're, a, you're a using fine a, violation? It could be a fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Depends. So if it's an egregious one, you know, it could be... Um, it, could get, it could get quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, so after that, um, if you look to the active ingredient, it'll be right below what we just read. So what's the active ingredient in this? Mm -hmm. So what, uh, in what situation would this be an important piece of, in when would this be an important piece of information? In every, in every instance, in my opinion. Yes. When somebody gets poisoned. Yeah, so like if, you, if you're taking someone to the hospital right. and you're calling and the doctor says, well, they're going to want to know, they, they, they might want to know the product, but Specifically, they're going to want to know that active. Yeah, that's going to help them yeah. help them treat it. Yeah. So then, if you go down to the bottom left, you're going to see the EPA reg number down there in little tiny font. Um, so that's going to be important if someone was using this and they needed to report their use. They're going to put in that EPA reg number. Uh, the signal word. So, like I said when I was talking about danger warning. Caution. Mm -hmm. There's three different three types of signal words. So this one is a caution. So if you were storing this in a shed, would you have to post? No, but you recommend it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we wouldn't be able to give a violation right. if you did. Yeah, good. Generally, caution signifies least hazard, warning, a little bit more hazardous, danger, the worst hazard. Uh, so then, an important, um, you'll see personal protective equipment down from the signal word. And this is going to tell you what you have to wear when you're using this product. So what do you have to wear um, if you're an applicator or a handler? Eye protection and a suit. Or so, under PPE, so a long sleeve shirt, long pants. Chemical resisting gloves made of barrier laminate and shoes plus socks. Okay. Now this is so this is what you have to wear according to this label. Now there's also, I'm gonna talk about it in another slide. There's also, if you're an employee that's using pesticides, you also have to always wear two other items. You have to always wear protective eyewear and chemical resistant gloves, which in this case it says you have to wear chemical resistant mm -hmm. gloves anyway. Now, if you are an owner-operator, you don't have to do that. You don't have to wear that, those goggles and gloves. But do you have to follow the label? Yes. Yes, because everyone has to follow the label. Correct. Now, the employees have to follow the label and they have to follow the, the, those regulations too. Okay. That's PPE, that's always an important one. That's one of the first things we look for when we see a pesticide application, when we go look at the label, we, we go see what they're, what they're supposed to be wearing. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, first day, that's at the bottom right there. It's going to tell you, yeah. And you can wear a suit instead of black pants. I mean, you can be yes. more protective. Yes, than absolutely. Uh, so the first day, pretty self-explanatory. It's going to tell you what you need to do. Get it in your eyes, swallow, get it on your skin. Environmental hazards. It's going to be on the next page, page two. And this is going to be where it tells you what you can't, where you can't spray it. So what can't you do? Where shouldn't you spray this one? Directly to water. So basically stay away from areas with water. As we talked about earlier, don't apply when weather conditions favor drift. So mm -hmm. if it's windy, so you always gotta be looking if it's windy or not. Mm -hmm. And I like, so I say read the label, so if you look under that when it says notice, see, even on the label it tells you to read the entire label. That's how important that is. See that? See, it's like a circular thing. So on the label it's telling you to read the entire label. Where are you looking? Under environmental hazards, notice. Got it. Read yeah. the entire label. That's my semi, just a side show, if I can just tell. Um, so then, after environment, environmental hazards, uh, restricted entry interval. And that's going to be under agricultural use requirements. Mm -hmm. Now, the restricted entry interval is the time where you can't, after you spray, there can be no one in that field for that amount of time. So what's the REI for this one? Mm -hmm. Whole day. So no one can be in that field for a whole day. Unless um, you want it to do early entry. PPE requirements, which it lists what you have to wear for that. Now, what we generally see, you know, we don't see guys sending their guys in during that REI. Well, it's just better. It's better. It's, yeah, it's comp. It could get, if There's we see, liability. yeah, liability. If we see that as the ag department, we're driving by, we're going to go, you know, uh, even if they're wearing the right stuff, it's just kind of, guys don't even deal with it. So then it goes on to talk about other stuff, storage, disposal, you know, mixing directions, things like that. So now after going through this, can this be used, can this be used on cannabis? No. How come? Because it's not on the list. It's not on the... The PPR list. Well, specifically from a list, from, just from this label. Yeah. It is. It's not listed in that first yeah. group. Yeah. It's, it's not turf grass, landscape ornamentals, so it doesn't fall within that. It's pretty specific in what it says you can use this on. Okay. Are there any pesticides yet that California has determined to be used on campus? I lost, I no, just, so, I helped read the original list. I've lost track of all of Right. That. And I'll, after the talk, I'll talk to you in more detail about <coughs> what's kind of going on with that. Okay. Okay, so we kind of went over this already a little bit. So personal protective equipment. Um, this is going to vary depending on the label and what you're using. But if you're an employee and you're, if you're an employer and you have an employee spraying, you, they always have to have these items: is protective eyewear, chemical resistant gloves. They have to be at least 14 mils thick. So that's a good note to write down. Always. So if the label said you don't have to wear anything, right? You still have to, you still wear, have to wear those. You still have to wear those two things, exactly. Now, do you have to wear this if you're even using an exempt product? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because it's still a pesticide. Now, the owners don't have to wear these, but they do have to follow the label. So you see there's multiple, there's, you kind of, it takes a little bit while, a little while to learn. There's multiple layers, layers to it's this. Like yeah. Goes in yeah. So just an example of kind of what it looks like on a label, you know, it'll always, it'll always kind of be in this format. So, what's wrong with this picture? 
many things. So tell, tell me, give me some, what do you see wrong? After well, all we just talked about, what's... Well, I haven't read the level, level label, but her, um, she doesn't have gloves or protective eyewear, and she most likely needs long sleeves and pants, but I don't know that because I haven't read the label. Mm -hmm. um, so that's so that's actually good. I like that you said that because that's a good way to think. You haven't read the label yet, right? So you don't actually know exactly what if what's required of that. But Other you said you, you do know that she's not wearing the eyewear. She's not wearing the most likely the label is going to require long sleeve shirt, long pants. I haven't seen any labels that don't require that. Yeah. I love, I like how she's wearing the mask, but she doesn't have it over her face. It's like... I see that all the time. Yeah. A suspicious Pepsi bottle there, you know, I don't know what's going on there, but... Um, yeah, so if we if we rolled up and saw this, we'd stop it, stop it right away until she could get what she needed. And it would probably, this would probably be a fine. What are the fines range? So... Right, what's the map? I guess minimum and maximum. The maximum is if someone got hurt. So it has to deal with, um, so there's there's three different categories. So there's category A, that's if someone actually got hurt. Mm -hmm. There's a category B, that's if, if something happened where someone could have gotten hurt. So if you didn't train someone, nothing, no one did get hurt, but if you didn't train someone and they sprayed, that's considered a B, they, they could have gotten hurt from that. And then there's a category C, which is basically just paperwork, use reports, did it turn the use reports. So a C is $50 to, oh man, I haven't looked at these in a while, $50 to $400. A B is um, $400 to 1000 Per don't, occurrence? Per violation. per violation. Yeah. And then a type A is... Um, yeah, don't quote me on this. It's mm -hmm. up to five thousand. Up to five thousand dollars, I think. I have it in my breaks. It gets expensive. So if like three people got hurt, you could potentially be up to ten, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And if it's, you know, if it's um, something with intent, it sometimes when there's intent involved, when oh, someone intent, hurt, yeah. hurting someone, then that can even get into criminal. Things, so. so, if you spray during the wind and the spray injures someone, would that be intent or non-intent? Well, you'd have to. So, you'd have to do the investigation. I mean, most likely. I mean, it would not automatically be intent. No, but they would. That would be treated as an A. Yeah. Violation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's also it would be more like if, if two people got in a fight right. at work and somebody like yeah. sprayed them with drugs. I heard. Yeah, that's happened. Before. Actually, it does. I, I have no doubt in my mind. But my thinking was intent from the perspective of you know better and you did it anyway. Yeah, and that could be tough to determine. Determine sometimes, but yeah, I mean, if someone if someone tells you, it's like, yeah, I just. I knew it was windy, and I just went ahead and did it anyway. You know, that would just be things that were hashed out in the investigation. You know, most of the time people don't. People are pretty good. And they don't try not to do that. So hazard communication. Um, this is so whether you have field workers or handlers, you have to have what's called um, they're called the A8s and A9s. Pesticide safety information series available on site for your employees. And these are just, um, they're kind of quick grab packets with um, information on worker health and safety, medical care, um, symptoms of poisoning, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, this is what they look like. So, this is one of the, actually, one of the laws that we look for, one of the requirements for our uh, inspection. So, if you see this little portion here, uh, where it says emergency medical care, the employer has to have that filled out. And if they don't have it filled out, yeah. I just heard. Oh, sorry. Um, if the employer doesn't have this filled out properly, that's a violation. And it's usually easily fixable on site. That's a paper with C violation? 
Ooh, okay, see, you see, you're starting to think about things. So, well, I know, it, it, yeah, I've been in farming for 40 years. Yes, so it could, it, de it depends. It depends. Because you could almost say that that could be a B violation, where if you did you didn't have that information oh, yeah, available yeah, to them, so it could hurt. Potential. potential to hurt. It could be both. Now, if you had, now if you had, so some guys actually have the hospital phone number posted elsewhere. Uh -huh. So if we actually saw that, then I would say at this point, not having this filled out probably would be a C. But if you had no other hospital sounds, number, yeah. That sounds fair. Mm -hmm. So you, that's the kind of stuff that we you kind of <coughs> look for. And that's why I said these laws can get kind of convoluted sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, so is it that interpretation? For, yeah, some, some interpretation. Um, so the next thing is the application specific information and this is just what you have to have on site. You have to have the de detailed information on the application. Um, and it's for employees or inspectors to see what was sprayed, how much, when you applied it, where. Um, and this has to be updated for the past uh, 30 days. So if you make an application, you have to write all that information down and have it in a central location for any employee to go look at when they want to. Uh, decontamination. Uh, this is an important, important regulation. Um, there's three items always required for decontamination, whether it's field workers or handlers. And you need clean water, single-use towels, and soap. And if you're also applying pesticides, you also need a change of coveralls. So, for soap, hand sanitizers, wet towelettes don't count. That was one of the changes in the work of protection standard. You actually have to have soap. And for the water, for field workers, you need one gallon per, per field worker at the start of the day. For handlers, you need three gallons per handler. So, three handlers need at least nine gallons. If you have a hose, that counts. That, that counts as your water. So field worker, one gallon. Handler, three. Handler, three. Mm -hmm. And you just do the math in there. Right. Uh, so respiratory protection. Um, you have to have a respiratory program when there's um, these situations. So if a respirator is required by the label, you have to have a respiratory program. If it's required by a regulation or if it's required by the employer. So if the employer has their own policy where they require a type A respirator, they get, um, they, they are automatically kicked in to have that respiratory program. And the components of that are having a written program. So you have to outline who's the person administering that, who's keeping track of all you fit testing. County forms for that? We we do Is have a I think we have a example of what that would look like. Yeah. Um, so you have to have fit test records. So type being respirators, you have to send your employees to get fit tested. Um, who's qualified to fit test? There are a few companies around here um, that do it. Um, and that can so it has you. to be a company. You know, I actually have to, ch I'll have to check on that mm -hmm. of what actually, um, who is qualified to do that. But it's like people like MVP yeah. and uh, Seika, yeah. I think they're qualified to do that. Um, but I'm I actually, so let me check on that though, because I actually think that the employer so can do that too. Right. Well, let me ask Andy. Do you know who, how, how you have to be qualified to do fit testing? Can the employer just do that? Yes. Well, if you mean if you like get out of the self kit? You can buy and like, a respiratory protection program. Yes, you can. You can buy kits that tell you how to do it for different tests. Because there's two, right? There's the there's the fit, and there's also the vape. You know, can you smell, smell that? All? Yeah. The oil. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, the the employer can administer that. 
Yeah. Uh, then another part of it is the medical evaluations, and so you have to actually send your employees to make sure that they're healthy enough to be able to use a respirator. And proper inspection and storage, right? So you have to be storing. Is it even medical doctor, or can like a, an assistant do that medical evaluation? It has to be a medical doctor. Thank yeah. You. People usually they go to job care. Job care is good. Yeah. Care. yeah. So what I would suggest is. Oh, God, sorry, just one more question. Yeah. Does it have to be an MD or can it be like an acupuncturist or chiropractor? It has to be someone, physician's assistant, MD, someone with a. It current. can be a physician's assistant. I believe so. Thank you. Right, because they're pretty much doctors. They can write prescriptions. Like Matt was saying, a lot of a lot of the conventional ag guys would send their employees to a job care or somewhere to get that. Yeah, get in the cannabis done. industry, uh, they typically use alternative doctors, so that's why I was asking. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, so I guess so. After going through this, you know, I would suggest. If you are not using any pesticides that require a respirator, if you want to make your life easier, another option is what's called, um, so if you wanted to su supply the dust mist masks, what you do is called a volunteer use display, and it's a piece of paper that you hang up, and it's got some language on it saying, you know, we have these masks available for employees to use, store here, Blah blah blah. Voluntary use display. Use display. Yeah, but because like if you require your employee, if it's a policy, you're kick, you're getting kicked into a whole world of yeah. There's yeah. like eight pages of regulations for respiratory. So now, I mean, if you're using something that requires it, then you don't really have a choice. But if you do have the choice, you know, a lot of people do that option, the voluntary use display. That would probably be easier. Yes. Very much so. So that's why I'm going to be Because I, I am, I used to be a primary care physician as an acupuncturist, and I, to me, anything in the air that isn't oxygen and carbon dioxide is not healthy. So, you know, prevention is 100% of healthcare in my opinion. And so, uh, last but not least, uh, so you want to be looking at your environment. That's what we were talking about earlier. You know, Always be looking at your environment. Is it windy? Is the pesticide going to drift? Always have to be looking at drifts. Um, is it, what's the temperature like? There's certain pesticides where you can't apply it at above a certain temperature because it could be phytotoxic to the plants. Is it going to rain? Is, it, is there a lot of dew outside? There's some some pesticides don't allow you to apply when it's rain within a 24-hour forecast. What about morning dew? I've um, not seen that before. Hmm? I haven't seen a morning dew morning. Well, you have to kind of think what about how the plant's going to... It might not be an explicit warning, but you want to think about how, you know, if the plants are kind of wet, mm -hmm. how that product is going to, you know, how it's going to stick to that plant right so um just yeah general wet rain moisture um inversion layer there's an inversion layer you know that product the the plume could stick under that layer and drift potentially and not dissipate right. so that's something you have to look out for do you have neighbors do you have any neighbors do you have a lot of neighbors is it you know windy and is it going to blow on your neighbors do your neighbors know what you're using um, it's kind of good to have a good rapport with and have them know kind of what your situation is. You next to a water source, lake, stream, or you on a hill, is there potential for runoff, right? Um, and always remember to read the label. So, uh, so I have a question. Uh huh. Um, if you have a pesticide that you're applying, and I take vineyards for instance, that is danger, mm -hmm. and you're next to a class three stream, which is like a ditch. 
and it's you know not damp at the moment, but a week later there's because it's thirty days, right? Uh, a week later there's a unexpected rain, or you know a week and a half later there's an unexpected rain, which then would carry whatever drift was in the ditch down to wherever. How do you manage that? What how does how does that scenario look upon? So you're asking if there was any drift into that ditch. Yeah. How do we prevent? And then it rains a week later, unexpectedly. Well. How, what does any you know? Is that a violation? What? How does how does that look? Like? No, I mean. So there's only a, there's there's only so much we can do. kind of do, right? I get it. Um, I would say probably the amount that's drifting. You know, if it's not windy, the the amount of drift that would get in there is probably very minimal. Mm -hmm. You know, so at that point, if it did rain and it you know washed, it would be a minimal amount, but. I mean, it's t they're technically not drift. I mean, it's not like major drift, right. like into a major like body of water. I just want to understand where that line's kind of drawn. Yeah, and I mean, you got to remember. I mean, when people are dealing with pesticides, there's always going to be some kind of uncertainty and un. Of course, there's yeah, a variable. The variable, yeah, there's More variables that you can't um, predict, and um, and it's usually. And the amount is key. very, like if it's like trace amounts, you know, it's usually considered, I don't want to say it's like considered okay, but it's not like, it's there's, not as detrimental. Yeah, like it's not like if you actually like the tank was leaking yeah, and spilling and into it yeah. and, and like mm -hmm. actually going down the river, so. Well, there was no water is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Because, you know, water and these class three streams, you know, they see it a little differently. They don't want any chemicals or pesticides 50 feet from them. So if you're 50 feet and you're spraying, I'm just trying to understand where the county and the Department of Pesticide Regulations at versus where what quality is at on that. Yeah, I don't think um, I don't think DPR has any explicit like distances. I think what their law their laws are mainly you have to have them stored. Yeah, it's in a, a in a lockable where it's if it spills secondary. it's not going to secondary. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. You can't definitely can't store them like outside. Okay. Yeah. So. So it sounds like there's a big gap. There. I'm not trying to say anything's wrong, but okay. there are some extreme situations. Yeah, that can be, like, I'm thinking out loud. Sorry. Okay. So, um, any. Other questions? We what talked about this a lot. This is very informative. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so, in case, I mean, you've probably been to DPR's website, but mm -hmm. just in case, I mean, there's a lot of great resources there. Um, they also have all their laws and regs uh, listed on the whole page there. Um, and Pesticide Safety Study Guide, yeah, you got it right there. Right next to you, so. Um, mm -hmm. I give them that for free in my comments. Okay, awesome. Yeah. It's just a, if it's necessary. They need, I'm very much into being proactive, and because, you know, farming is a constantly changing thing. The weather's not, I mean, you never know what's going to happen. And so, from my perspective, people need to be educated so that they can manage themselves properly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's why I did that. Great. Thanks for coming, Julia. Thank, Thank you, you guys.